impact in the community? I'm going to say, uh, Full disclosure, I actually live in South Carolina and I'm involved in organizations across the river and in Savannah. There's one in particular in South Carolina called the Community Foundation of the Low Country, which is incredibly impactful. It uh, does its own projects, but it also supports so many nonprofits in the Low Country. Good, very good. So what inspirational quote do you wish you had penned? Okay, so I, I really didn't wish I penned this, but it is a, uh, it's a, a stanza from a poem that I've kind of lived by my entire life. And the poem, and most of you have heard it, it's um, Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. And the final stanza is, um, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. It's kind of how I lived my life. I've always done things through the military and uh, through business and with my family. I've always challenged my family to take that road less traveled, do things that everyone else isn't doing, take the hard, absolutely the hard right versus the, the easy wrong. That's, that's my, again, I, I don't wish to be a poet and I didn't <laughs> wish to pen it, but that's one that I've lived by. Good, good. Well, that kind of leads me into, so what is on your bucket list that you haven't done? Yeah, there is, that's a very easy question. And my wife knows this. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to tour the, uh, the beaches of Normandy. That's, mm -hmm. I've studied it. Yeah. I've, um, my all time favorite series was Band of Brothers. Uh, I've, I've I'm really, really want to see that in the American Military Cemetery. And just the first few days after D-Day, I want to tour all of that and, and, and absorb it. That's impressive. Okay, one last question. Okay. So what are you most proud of that happened during your presidency? So, you know, interestingly, I'm, I'm gonna mention a couple of, or a few things. One now is something we also did my, my um, Rotary year in that we had the same number of new Rotarians as we did past presidents. So we actually assigned each new Rotarian to interview and reintroduce past presidents for
you should be right here. <clears throat> it's, uh, I should be standing. Oh, your speaker always sits just you gonna eat? for the podium. You don't eat anything? Uh, not before I get up and talk. You know why? Because when I get up there, it's too far back. Pull it towards you. I was going to say, please tell me I can oh, move yeah, this. Yeah, pull it. Just be careful of the banner falling. Yep. Yep. But yeah, it needs to come. Oh, I've, I've got to have it here. Here, let's do this time. I'm going to pick that up, yep. pull that back down. Now I'm going to work it back farther. Can't have that way up there. That's good. Yeah. I always have to do that. Good God. It's ridiculous. And see, Pat, most these people are going to talk to that mic this far away. Yeah. I got to think about that guy the other day from uh, <clears throat> from uh, Major League Baseball. Just, it's just standing there. Nobody can hear you. You come all the way from New York. And and see, I didn't sold. realize it because I could hear it. Otherwise, I would have said, you need to be closer to the mic. Oftentimes, I would get up. And, in fact, did I not do that? You him? did that, yes. but, but it was still this far away from him, and he made no Probably when I did that, he probably schools. stepped back even further. Well, and he didn't, he didn't, you can tell, he didn't do a lot of close cool He just, people that don't do that. I'm going to go look and see what, what yeah, that is. Yeah, go ahead and get you something to eat. I don't like to eat either before I do that. You know what will happen to me is I'll be sitting there going, <clears throat> clear my throat. I will too. Or burping. Or burping. I'll be burping. But you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, 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 I tell you, 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 you don't do think that, three quarters of the room is going to be empty? No. Hey, Dan. Good. How about you?
So welcome to the Rotary Club of Savannah's February 28th, 2022 meeting. Our song leader today is Alex Kaminsky, a student at the Savannah Country Day School, and Fran's granddaughter, and I'm gonna hold the mic for her because she's gonna play the guitar. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties above the fruited plain. America. on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea oh beautiful for patriotism that sees thee Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance like the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation under God, and justice for all. Well, Kelsey will now give our invocation. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, teach us that even if we can't do great things, we can at least do small things in a great way. May we always be sincere in our efforts to help others in need. And may we be reminded by the words of Mother Teresa that the fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. And the fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. Now bless this food to our use and us to your service. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Rabbi Haas, our secretary treasurer, will now introduce our guests and visiting Rotarians. <laughs> Alex, that was amazing. You come from a wonderful family. You're the best one, by the way, of all of them. Yeah, by, by far. So welcome everybody here. I'm always asked to tell a story, so I just wanna talk about how much I support our military. It's an incredible thing to be part of this country and see what's going on around the world that we have such a great one. We had a wonderful group of military coming from uh, Fort Stewart a few years ago at our, our, our museum. My wife was the docent. They didn't know she was my wife. And I like to teach people about Judaism. So I talked about the museum and I showed him this wonderful docent and I told him, wow, our docents are wonderful people. We're a great big family here at Mikveh Israel. So I took the docent and I leaned her down and then I gave her a big giant kiss on the lips right in front of these military who didn't know she was my wife. And then I said, we are welcoming everybody. Anybody who likes to be a docent can be a docent here. You all are welcome. And then I walked out. If my wife didn't tell them that I was her husband, they probably think Judaism is a cult now. And I am the Ayatollah of Judaism. So 
I don't know if you should bow before me or not. I don't know. That's something later. So we're going to welcome everybody again. Alex, that was amazing, really amazing. Uh, welcome to Ray Rayback again, a visiting member. Uh, David Jones, visiting of Rotary. Please stand when your name is called. The Kaminsky clan who came here to hear Alex, Myron, Adam, and Amy. I invite you guys. I don't see Amy, but I'm going to invite Myron and Adam to rise. And how do you pronounce it? Simsa Sirik. Simsa Sirik, who's a guest of Marjorie. Gene Dobbs Bradford, a guest of Ryan. Hunter Hall, a guest of Roger Moss. And Catherine Bauman, a guest of Kelly Weiss. Please give them all a big hand. Thank you, Robert. And I also want to welcome everybody on Zoom. Can you tell how many people are on there? Six? 36. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, OK, so a lot has happened since last week with Russia invading Ukraine. And I have asked Tom Roberts to give us some background of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Um, he writes a national security report monthly. Thank you. On your tables, there are two, um, two items there. Uh, one is on the chief of the general staff of the Armed Forces of Russia, it says bio. Uh, he is a close confidant of the um, uh, president and has been in that job for 12 years, has reorganized the Russian army, and uh, so his job is probably on the line right now. The second one is a uh, uh, information sheet on the Ukrainian army. The reason I bring these uh, to you is that uh, when you go to war, a lot of the countries uh, have press censorship. So what we're receiving on television and in the the truth. So there's some general comments that I might want to mention to you. Uh, so when you see the images or do your reading, the first is that uh, governments try to portray everything as rosy, and we know that. The second one is the numbers. A lot of numbers have been thrown around. Uh, the Russian Armed Forces is now a mechanized organization, and so a lot of those numbers are really in the support side. And so when they talk about 170,000, you could probably take uh, one to third, to maybe two thirds are in the support side. On the other side is the Ukrainians. Uh, they have a lot larger force than the Russians actually have. And uh, they are really focused on these territorial defense brigades that uh, are organized to fight in depth. And so the third point is the Russians own the ground they physically occupy. The rest of the land belongs to the Ukrainians. And the reason they're having some problems is that the Ukrainians are fighting them in depth. Uh, also, the U Ukrainians have a long tradition of guerrilla warfare. The uh, German army during World War II uh, ended up uh, putting over 100,000 uh, soldiers into Ukraine just to keep down the guerrilla warfare fighting. Um, and I would say the, the last point is, from what I've heard and seen, the Russian army hasn't gotten into the war mindset. And a lot of the uh, pictures I see, you, you want to look at them and you want to see what the vehicles look like, how close they are, uh, why are they on the roads, bumper to bumper. Those are all civilian mindsets. And um, so Putin has a, has a real job ahead of him. And I think this last week, the Europeans have uh, stepped up and if they'll be solid and uh, follow Margaret Thatcher's advice to Reagan, uh, we'll probably got a good future. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Very timely update. OK. Um, I'd now like to have Julie Olson come to the podium to announce the 
past president's interview in the Rotary Leadership Series. Thank you, Julie. So we're continuing to highlight past presidents. I'm probably the only one that has to pull the microphone down after you. <laughs> but, um, and some of you haven't jumped up and said, me, me, me. So just so you know, you have about a month to learn how to say, yes, I'd love to, if you're a past president, and we will be getting with you. But today we're gonna highlight, and we spoke with David Rosenblum. And David is a Citadel grad. He's also a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. He served for 30 years in the Army Active Reserves, Army Reserves and National Guard. He also now is the Vice President responsible for operations at the Kinnacle Group. So we're going to hear a few words from David. Well, thank you, David, for joining us today. You were the past president from 2008 and 2009, and we're excited to have you today. So we're going to get started and ask you, what organization are you a part of that has had a significant impact in the community? I'm going to say, uh, full disclosure, I actually live in South Carolina, and I'm involved in organizations across the river and in Savannah, there's one in particular in South Carolina called the Community Foundation of the Low Country, which is mm -hmm. incredibly impactful. It uh, does its own projects, but it also supports so many nonprofits in the Low Country. Good, very good. So what inspirational quote do you wish you had penned? Okay, so I, I really didn't wish I penned this, but it is a uh, it's a, a stanza from a poem that I've kind of lived by my entire life. And the poem, and most of you have heard it, it's um, Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. And the final stanza is, um, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. It's kind of how I lived my life. I've always done things through the military and uh, through business and with my family. I've always challenged my family to take that road less traveled, do things that everyone else isn't doing, take the hard, uh, do the absolutely the hard right versus the, the easy wrong. That's, that's my, again, I, I don't wish to be a poet and I didn't <laughs> wish to pen it, but that's one that I've lived by. Good, good. Well, that kind of leads me into, so what is on your bucket list that you haven't done? Yeah, there is, that's a very easy question. And my wife knows this, uh, one of these days, I'm going to tour the uh, the beaches of Normandy. That's mm -hmm. I've studied it. Yeah. I've um, my all-time favorite series was Band of Brothers. Uh, I've I've I'm really really want to see that in the American Military Cemetery and just the first few days after D-Day, I want to tour all of that and, and, and absorb it. That's impressive. Okay, one last question. Okay. So, what are you most proud of? that happened during your presidency? So, you know, interestingly, I'm, I'm gonna mention a couple of, or a few things. One, what we're doing right now is something we also did my, my um, Rotary year in that we had the same number of new Rotarians as we did past presidents. So we actually assigned each new Rotarian to interview and reintroduce past presidents for actually the same purpose, to learn more about some of our uh, more senior members and and you know what they did with rotary second thing um i'm really proud of the fact that i handed the gavel to the very first female president of the rotary club louisa abbott followed me and it was it really was a proud moment for me and uh, I'll, I'll never forget it um the last thing uh, really proud of really on an international level we uh, recruited acquired whatever it's called uh, more than 50 new Paul Harris Fellows during my, my tenure. So we were very proud of that. The Rhodey Foundation was a, was a real focus our year. And uh, we actually had a, a past international president come and speak to us and, and really sell the foundation. And uh, so, yeah, it really got our club moving in the right direction with respect to the Rotary Foundation and Paul Harris Fellowships. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, David, Certainly. for sharing today. Thanks. And I hope you all enjoyed learning more about David Rosenblum.
David Rosenblum, when I was a Red Badger, you asked me to go interview Dr. Sandy Shepard. And I'm so glad we have that video because Dr. Shepard's no longer with us. So I'd like to, all of us, to formally thank you, stand up, and, and thank you for your service above self, David. was great. Okay, I now like to have Malcolm Butler come to the podium to introduce our newest member. Thank you, Marjorie. <clears throat> I am pleased to introduce our newest member to Rotary, Joel Goodman. Joel is the Chief Investment Officer and a partner of the Fiduciary Group. Joel joined our firm in 2003. As timing is everything, the same morning I first met Joel for breakfast, our portfolio manager at the time resigned, and we hired Joel shortly thereafter. Joel is originally from Savannah and returned home after working in equity research in Baltimore for Leg Mason. He is married to Julie, who teaches Spanish at Savannah Country Day, and has two sons, Ben and Ross. Ben is a junior at Winthrop University, where he plays soccer for the Division I Eagles, and Ross is a senior at Country Day. Joel's mother, Lynn, and two brothers, Brad and Seth, also reside in Savannah. Joel graduated from Savannah Country Day and has been an active volunteer at the school, serving as president of the Alumni Association, chair of the school's endowment committee, and is currently the immediate past chair of the Board of Trustees. Joel also currently serves on the Board of Hospice Savannah. Outside of work, Joel enjoys playing golf, spending time at the beach in St. Simons, and traveling to watch his son's soccer games. Joel holds the Chartered Financial Analyst designation and is a graduate of the University of Georgia and Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. So he enjoys the best of both worlds, SEC football and ACC basketball. Please welcome Joel Goodman to the club. Joel, we've got a red badge for you. Go ahead and put that on. Uh, we ask that you help greet the members each week on Monday. We ask that you get involved with a committee. And there's a lot of leadership here, so don't you know rush them right now, but um, we'll give you a break for a year. But then we'll, we're going to get you. So, so let's please welcome Joel Goodman to the Rotary Club of Savannah. Okay, I'd now like to have Dr. Todd Gross come to the podium to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, President Marjorie. One thing I want to mention about David Rosenblum, this didn't happen when he was president. It happened when I was president, but you deserve the credit for it. We dug a well in Afghanistan, if you remember, and I was just fortunate enough that it happened I was president while you were in Afghanistan, so thank you very much. But the Rotary Club of Savannah dug a well in Afghanistan thanks to the United States Army and David Rosenblum. So thank you, David. That was terrific. Well, nearly a quarter of a century ago, in November of 1997, at the annual meeting of the Southern Historical Association, I was introduced to a young graduate student who was about to finish his PhD in history at the University of Florida. He made such an impression on me that the following spring, when I was looking for someone to join the team at the Georgia Historical Society as our director of programs, I remembered this young man and I gave him a call. Have you found a job yet? I asked. No, came the fortuitous reply. Then how would you like to come to Savannah and work for me? I said. It was the beginning of a great friendship and an intellectual collaboration that helped catapult the Georgia Historical Society into a nationally recognized educational and research institution. Well, by now, you have surely guessed 
that that young man I met 24 and a half years ago is today's speaker, Dr. Stan Deaton. He's still a young man. Stan began his career at the Georgia Historical Society as a director of programs, but we quickly discovered that his true talent lay in his ability to make history accessible to a wide audience. With an undergraduate degree in journalism from the Grady School at the University of Georgia and a PhD in history from the University of Florida, Stan combines his deep historical knowledge and understanding with a journalist's passion for seeking the truth and changing perspectives. And I can think of no better example of this than the role he played as scriptwriter and host of the television and radio program Today in Georgia History, jointly produced by the Georgia Historical Society and Georgia Public Broadcasting. Over the course of its two-year run, Today in Georgia History was watched or heard by over six million Georgians. It's still used on a regular basis in history classrooms around the state, making Stan Deaton something of a celebrity among eighth grade students who who affectionately referred to him as the Deatonator. In recognition of his extraordinary work on this project, in 2013, Stan won two Emmy Awards from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. What I'd like to do now is to take a look at the February 12 episode of the Today in Georgia History program, and then a very brief video about the Georgia Historical Society. You'll see him in one, hear him in the other, and you'll see why we call him the voice and the face of the Georgia Historical Society. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. After years of planning and two months crossing the Atlantic, James Oglethorpe and 114 colonists climbed 40 feet up the bluff from the Savannah River on this day in 1733 and founded the colony of Georgia. George II granted the Georgia trustees a charter for the colony a year earlier. The trustees' motto was, non civi sed alis, not for self, but for others. Georgia would be a philanthropic and military enterprise that would provide the worthy poor a new start and serve as a buffer between Spanish Florida and the English colonies. The trustees prohibited slavery and large land holdings. Georgians would work for themselves on small farms. In the end, there were no debtors among them. In November 1732, Oglethorpe and the colonists boarded the Anne in Graves Inn, and after stopping briefly in South Carolina, arrived safely in Georgia. The 13th and last of the British colonies on mainland North America grew to become the largest of the United States east of the Mississippi after its founding on February 12, 1733, today in Georgia history. Today in Georgia History is made possible by the generous support from the Robert W. Woodruff Foundation and is a joint production of the Georgia Historical Society and Georgia Public Broadcasting. For more on this topic, go to todayingeorgiahistory.org. In 1733, the Georgia trustees founded the 13th colony on the noble principle of non civi sed alis, not for self, but for others. Founded with this same motto in 1839, the Georgia Historical Society, GHS, has grown into a nationally recognized research and educational institution. We believe in the value of history. Dedicated to collecting, preserving, and sharing Georgia history, the Research Center houses the oldest and one of the most outstanding collections related to Georgia and its role in American history. We believe that public knowledge of our past is fundamental to our future. Each year, the Georgia Historical Society selects iconic companies in our state to honor through the Georgia Business History Initiative. By showcasing these companies, GHS seeks to teach Georgia students, citizens and tourists alike about the pivotal role of Georgia's leading businesses in the economic, cultural, and social development of Georgia and the United States. We believe in educating future generations. The Georgia Historical Society fulfills its commitment to teaching and research by providing educational resources that explore our state's and nation's past. Making the past relevant to the present is at the core of our mission 
and helps to create a better future. Each year, through the Georgia History Festival, a variety of public programs, exhibits, in-school events, and curriculum bring history to life for students of all ages and encourage Georgians to engage in the richness and diversity of our shared past. We believe our shared history is what binds us together as Americans. In conjunction with the governor's office, the Georgia Historical Society reestablished the Georgia trustees as a way of recognizing Georgians whose history-making accomplishments and community service reflect the highest ideals of the founding body of trustees. The governor annually appoints the new trustees who are the embodiment of the noble principle upon which Georgia and the Georgia Historical Society were founded. Non Sibi said Alice. We believe in not for self, but for others. As the premier independent statewide institution responsible for collecting, examining, and teaching Georgia history, we believe that creating a better understanding of our past helps us to create a better future. We believe in the value of history. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium Doc, the Elaine B. Andrews Distinguished Historian at the Georgia Historical Society, Dr. Stan Deaton. Well, thank you, Todd, and I appreciate you all sitting through that valiantly. Um, of all the pleasures of coming to the Rotary Club and seeing old friends, the one I did not anticipate today is hearing David Rosenblum quote Robert Frost. That was impressive, David, really. I mean that, as are you, and I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank you for the chance to be back. Um, it's always a pleasure to come to Rotary. I think Todd and I figured out, <clears throat> both of us being historians, it's been six years since I've been here speaking, so I'm glad to be back. Um, and we'll get right to it. We're talking about the presidency today sort of, as you'll see. Um, the English romantic poet, Percy Shelley said, that power poisons every hand that touches it. Let me say that again. Power poisons every hand that touches it. The headlines bear this out right now, and history is littered with the names of those who ruthlessly attained power, wielded it arbitrarily, and then refused to give it up. But is it true in our own history? I will start with that group known as the American Founders. And I think it's worth noting that for me, what sets George Washington and the other American Founders off from revolutionaries in other countries is that none of them, particularly Washington, craved power for the sake of having authority. They all wanted fame and glory, but not by achieving great power, but rather for serving the greater good. These men were not autocratic psychopaths. They had good homes, good families, and stable emotional psyches. They could all be trusted with power. And with few exceptions, that has been the hallmark not only of American politics in general, but with the American presidency. In one of history's most famous stories, you're probably familiar with this, King George III asked the American painter Benjamin West, who was in London, what Washington would do after winning independence. West replied, they say he will return to his farm. King George was incredulous. If he does that, he said, he will be the greatest man in history. The implication, of course, being nobody does that. Now, you know the story, Washington and his French allies defeated the British at Yorktown in October 1781, which is widely considered to be the end of the American Revolution. But the British still held several key American cities, not least among them New York, Charleston, and the one we're in now, Savannah. Washington certainly didn't consider the revolution over while these threats remained. But the next year, as peace negotiations went on in Europe, the British Army evacuated Savannah on July 11th. Charleston on December 14th, and finally, the British evacuated New York on November 25th, 1783. One month later, George Washington rode to Annapolis, Maryland, where Congress was in session to resign the commission 
he had accepted in June 1775, eight and a half years earlier. Let's pause for a moment and consider what he was doing. In June 1775, Congress had vested full military authority in Washington to head the Continental Army as Commander-in-Chief, and he had done so without fail and almost without opposition for the duration of the conflict, which was very long. At least twice toward the end of that period, he had been encouraged, however, by others to seize power as either dictator or king. Despite the victory at Yorktown, the independent United States was not in good shape, and its future did not seem promising. The Confederation Congress was weak and had virtually no ability to raise revenue to pay the expenses of the country, chief among them, of course, the soldiers and officers of the Continental Army, whose pay was months, if not years, in arrears at that point. The Army had been woefully underclothed, underfed, and underpaid for the entire conflict, and people, quite frankly, were fed up. Inflation was rampant, then as now, with no reliable national currency, with the war winding down, soldiers faced the prospect of no money and no jobs as they returned home. Now was the time for Washington to strike. On May 22, 1782, with the British Army still holding those three key American cities, Washington received a letter from Colonel Louis Nicola of Pennsylvania. Nicola proposed that Washington seize power with the help of the army and declare himself either dictator or king. He should then establish a strong national government capable of meeting its financial obligations. Make no mistake, if one colonel thought this and would write it down on paper, many officers and rank and file in the army thought the same thing. It had apparently been talked about for quite some time. Nicola was proposing nothing less, of course, than a military coup. Revolutions, as we know, often dissolve into dictatorships. Chaos and uncertainty breed the conditions for a strong man to seize power, claiming to have all the answers and the power to solve seemingly unsolvable problems. Why should the American Revolution have been any different? If we think this strain does not run in our national veins, we are mistaken. What did Washington do? Did he ponder the prospect and the temptation to become King George I of the United States or George the Autocrat, who, like Putin, stands for election and wins with 99% of the vote? Did he choose to seize the opportunity to crown himself emperor like Napoleon did? If there was ever a moment in American history when one individual could have felt justified in seizing the reins of power and doing the unthinkable, this was it. There was no central government, no executive branch, no federal bureaucracy, no Supreme Court, no federal courts at all, no National Guard, and he was the head of the National Army. You couldn't even charge Washington with acting unconstitutionally because there was no constitution and there were no constitutional guardrails, only the Articles of Confederation. One can argue that there was not even really a nation, per se, outside of the man who, above all others, embodied the United States, if anyone did. Rule of law? Washington could have been the law. And why not? No. Washington sat down and responded to Nicola with scorn and contempt. And I quote him here. With a mixture of great surprise and astonishment, I read with attention the sentiments you have submitted to my perusal. Be assured, sir, no occurrence in the course of the war has given me more painful sensations than your information of there being such ideas existing in the army as you have expressed, and I must view them with abhorrence and reprehend them with severity. I am much at a loss. This was the, really the part that got Washington. I am much at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an address, which to me seems big with the greatest mischiefs that can befall my country. You couldn't have found a person to whom your schemes were more disagreeable." Unquote. Let's pause for just a moment here and consider the reception Nicola's letter might have received in other hands even among some of Washington's contemporaries, but not him. 
I continue, let me conjure you, if you have any regard for your country, he said, for yourself or posterity or respect for me, banish these thoughts from your mind and never communicate as from yourself or anyone else a sentiment of like nature. Imagine getting that letter from George Washington. In short, he said, just like the sheriff in deliverance said, don't ever do this again. Don't even think it. And Nicola, by the way, wrote one letter explaining, a second letter explaining, and then he had one of those oh crap moments and wrote a third letter trying to explain to Washington, it's not what you think, I, I was just, Washington had none of it. But less than a year later, it happened again. Despite considerable pressure, Congress still hadn't raised money to pay the army. And the limitations of the Articles of Confederation meant that Congress could only request money from the states, and the states absolutely refused. It also looked like Congress was going to have to go back on a promise to pay Continental Army officers a promised pension when they left the service. All through the fall and winter of 1782 and 83, officers met in secret, grumbled, and complained, and as you can imagine, morale hit rock bottom. <clears throat> they hadn't been paid in two years. In late December 1782, 13 generals signed a petition that was carried to Congress by five of them and formally presented it. It said, among other things, we have borne all that men can bear. Our property is exhausted. Our private resources are at an end and our friends are wearied out and disgusted with our incessant application for support. It ended with a not so subtle warning. Quote, the uneasiness of the soldiers for want of pay is great and dangerous, and any further experiments on their patient patients must have fatal consequences. It didn't take a genius to figure out what that meant. Still, nothing from Congress. As spring approached, the grumbling turned to planning. Now, historians debate how serious to take this so-called Newburgh conspiracy, so named because Washington's army was in winter quarters, at Newburgh, New York, keeping an eye on the British in New York City. But Washington took the threat again of a military coup serious enough to postpone a visit to his beloved Mount Vernon to stay in camp and address the officers. His longtime aide, Alexander Hamilton, was now sitting in Congress, knew all about what was going on. He warned that something was afoot. Soldiers, he said, felt that if they laid down their arms peacefully, quote, they will part with the means of obtaining justice. Washington wrote a friend, quote, the temper of the army has soured and become more irritable than in any period since the start of the war. On March 10th, 1783, anonymous papers began circulating in the Newburgh camp, calling for a mass meeting of the officers to discuss their grievances and plan strong action of some kind. Washington was not invited to the meeting. He was only wanted if he would agree to head up a march on Congress and seize the reins of power. For that role, however, Horatio Gates was apparently willing to help dislodge Washington and seize power and lead the march on Congress without him. Washington famously faced down his officers that day in part by making promises and in part by a bit of political theater, so the legend goes. After walking in unannounced, he took the stage and stood before them as I stand before you, pleaded with the officers not to throw away everything they had fought so hard for. When his pleas fell on stony silence and deaf ears, he pulled out a letter from a congressman to read to the assembled. And at this point, he paused and seemed bewildered, paused for a moment as though he were having difficulty with the letter, and then he reached into his pocket again, and he took out a pair of eyeglasses. He apologized for the interruption and remarked quietly, as he put his glasses on, gentlemen, you must excuse me. I have already grown gray in the service of my country. I am now going blind. That, according to legend, melted every heart in the room. The coup at that moment was dead. There was only one American who could play the role of Caesar, and he refused it. For a second time, the most perilous moment in the history of the young United States was averted that day. Hamilton, who knew Washington as well as anyone could, told his fellow congressman that Washington would never do it. He would rather, Hamilton said, be cut to pieces. He knew his man. 
David Cobb, one of Washington's aides, wrote later, quote, I have ever considered that the United States are indebted for their Republican, small r, Republican form of government solely to the firm and determined Republicanism of General Washington on that day. Washington didn't so much defy the pattern of revolutionaries who became dictators, he actually reversed the pattern. Previous and subsequent dictators portrayed themselves as personifying the revolution they led. Think Castro here for a moment. And without them, they said, the movement would die without their permanent presence. You need me. This won't work unless I'm here permanently. Washington made himself the living embodiment of the revolution, but he proved that the revolution, and by extension the United States, was incompatible with the dictatorial power. In the new American Republic, all leaders, no matter how indispensable, were disposable. With all the uncertainty in the life of the United States at that moment, as I said, no one was ever better positioned or more justified in seizing power. It would have required almost no ambition for Washington to do that, to conclude that he and he alone could save America. But he didn't do it. <clears throat> this then was the man who literally stood before Congress two days before Christmas on December 23rd, 1783. At noon that day, Washington stood before the Congress with the hall crowded with members and spectators, both military and civilian. His hands were visibly trembling, the witnesses said as he spoke. Mr. President, he began, the great events on which my resignation having depended at length taken place, I now leave or have the honor of offering my sincere congratulations to Congress and of presenting before me, uh, myself before them to surrender into their hands the trust committed to me and to claim the indulgence of retiring from the service of my country. And at this point, his voice faltered too. Having now finished the work assigned to me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under who or, whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission and take my leave of all the employments of public life. That was it. He walked straight to the door with the hall ringing with applause. Thomas Jefferson, who was there that day, understood the enormity of what he had just witnessed. And he told a friend, the moderation and character of a single man has probably prevented the revolution from being closed as most others have been by a subversion of the liberty it was intended to establish. Washington was no Caesar, no Cromwell, no Napoleon, no Stalin, no Hitler, so many others who have disregarded his example or tried to. That one moment solidified his reputation, if nothing else had. Surrendering power peacefully has become one of the bedrock principles of American government and American leadership. What has been the legacy of his example? First and foremost, it can be seen in the creation of the office of the presidency itself, and more specifically, that office as it was defined by the Constitution as written in 1787. The Constitutional Convention met in Philadelphia that summer, as you know. The framers, as we call them, sitting in a room like this, debated the powers of the executive branch, with George Washington sitting right there in the room, presiding over the Constitution. Didn't say a word. Everyone knew he was going to be the first president. There was never any doubt. It was hard to talk about how corrupt a president might be one day with him sitting there, and the delegates were reluctant to talk about openly, talk about the office, talk about the issue, and to talk about the limits on the office. <clears throat> Only one delegate there had the stature to call everyone to account, and that was fellow founder, 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin. He stood up and said, we all know who the first president will be, but we don't know who may follow. Gentlemen, we must debate this office. And they did. But they gave the executive more power than they might have had Washington not been there. Pierce Butler from South Carolina said the next year, quote, the powers of the president are full great and greater than I was disposed to make them. Nor do I believe they would have been so great had not many of the members cast their eyes toward General Washington as president and shaped their ideas 
of the powers to be given a president by their opinions of his virtue, unquote. He didn't say a word, just his presence in the room and his powerful example influenced the shaping of the office of president. One historian is adamant that had Washington not been present, who they knew could be trusted with command and with power, they would have made the president a group of three people. Imagine the fun that would have been. Here is the best example of the old maxim that power succeeds best when it is invisible and indirect. The convention was well aware of what Americans would think when they heard that the executive was going to be just one person, just a few years removed from a war against a king. So in mid-August, someone leaked a bit of information that was printed in every paper in the country, and then, of course, tweeted it out. Here it is, quote, We are well informed that many letters have been written to members of the federal convention from different quarters respecting the reports idly circulating that it is intended to establish a monarchical, a monarchical government to which we uniformly answer, though we cannot tell you what we're doing affirmatively, we can negatively tell you what we're not doing. We never once thought of a king. Then there was his influence on the presidency itself. Washington was, of course, elected the first president, and he served two terms, not because the Constitution limited him, but because he limited himself. The Constitution was less than 10 years old when he stepped down in 1797, and the new national government didn't have the stability, the traditions, or the reverence that it has now. During Washington's first term, he tried to navigate the shoals of the two competing factions that developed during the debates over the powers of the new national government, especially those in the financial programs espoused by Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton. Of course, you remember Hamilton and Jefferson began to hate each other, arguing over the powers of the government. With Jefferson serving as Secretary of State, in every cabinet meeting, Washington got an earful listening to him talk about how Hamilton's policies favored the Eastern aristocrats at the expense of Jefferson's beloved farmers. Hamilton, he said, was openly steering the country toward a monarchy. Out of this conflict, we have them to thank for it. The first political parties in America arose, the Jeffersonian Republicans, the Hamiltonian Federalists. Jefferson seriously believed that Federalists weren't just political opponents, that they were, in fact, British revolutionaries, reactionaries, whose financial policies would create an aristocracy, would overthrow the legacy of the American Revolution, and, in fact, reinstate a monarchy. This wasn't just rhetoric. Jefferson believed it. Conversely, Federalists were certain that Jefferson and his followers, in their admiration for the French Revolution, the support they gave to what they called the mob rule, and the leveling spirit of that revolution would one day deluge the United States in blood and anarchy, chaos. Now, before the notion of organized opposition settled into the American political tradition that we've all come to know and love, the Federalists and Republicans saw themselves as two differing factions. Uh, not that they both loved their country, not that these were competing visions, they feared, that Washington feared that their partisanship would in fact tear the country apart before it had a chance to develop. It would weaken the people's confidence in the legitimacy of their own government. He alone seemed to hold the country together. And people encouraged him, stay on, stay on, don't leave. Should he stay on indefinitely? Then as now, there's no guarantee that the American experiment would succeed. Most previous attempts at self-government had ended in dictatorships with kings, aristocrats, or worse. The politics of democratic republics, as we know, in which people govern, can be very messy, as we know all too well. Political chaos and upheaval can generate instability and fear, which historically has caused people to turn to a dictator or a messiah-like figure to bring order. We know the French Revolution ended with Napoleon. The strong man, as I said, with all the solutions and all the power, was for many people where the road of self-government always ended. In the tumultuous years following the revolution, and again in the 1790s, Washington could have played that role. Many of his fellow countrymen would have applauded him for it. We've seen that. Even had he not declared a dictatorship, he could have stayed on and served as president year after year, term after term, indefinitely until he died. He chose not to. He stepped down in 1797 because he understood that if this experiment in self-government was to work, he couldn't depend on one man. Political parties are no. He understood that the United States must always be a nation of laws, not of men, no matter who the president was. The nation would have to find a way to navigate its future as a democratic republic dedicated to ordered liberty 
and with competing political parties. So far, it has. What if he had listened to those who whispered that he should grasp the power that only he could claim? Had Washington been a different man with greater ambitions and less character, the history of the United States over the last two centuries would have been far different. The Constitution was the last formal act of the American Revolution, and it stamped irrevocably and for all time three great legacies of 1776. First, the United States would be an independent country. Second, it would be a republic. And third, that it would be a strong union, one nation, not 13, not 50. From these three commitments, there could be no turning back. George Washington, perhaps more than any other individual, was responsible for all three of those outcomes. And he did everything in his power to bequeath those three great legacies, not only to the people of his own time, but for all time. It's not our language that binds us together, not shared ethnicity or shared religious beliefs, but our continued commitment to the philosophy handed down to us by the American revolutionaries through the Constitution. And it is a philosophy, it's not a code of laws. Philosophies can outlast the conditions that gave them birth. Their philosophy, embodied in the example of George Washington, was very simple yet profound and revolutionary all at the same time. The people govern themselves through their elected representatives, and for the system to work, we must have free and open elections, and then we must all abide by the choices that the people make in free elections. Central to this is the idea that fundamental laws should be written, that government and the men and now women who run them at any given time cannot be arbitrary and capricious, they can't do whatever they want, that we're a government of laws, not of men or women, and no one is above the law that we are a self-governing republic and we must remain so. And all those in this self-governing republic hold power in the name of the people. And they must all surrender power peacefully and without violence when the people have spoken, whether we like the outcome or not. Those are the foundations of this great republic. It's been our creed since the Continental Congress endowed George Washington with the extraordinary power to lead an army of the people in a revolution to establish not a monarchy, not a dictatorship, but a self-governing republic. Its principles now enshrined into the Constitution and embodied in the simple but powerful example of our first president. The title of this was the presidency at a crossroads or a crisis in the presidency. There need never be as long as we have this for our lodestar. Make no mistake, George Washington was no saint. I don't mean to imply that he was. He was a man with all the flaws inherent in the species but he innately understood the incalculable damage he could have done to his fellow Americans, to this country, and to generations yet unborn had he chosen a different path. By surrendering power, by reversing the pattern, by stepping away when others might have grasped the crown, he launched the American experiment on a firm foundation of principled and moral leadership that made it clear that anyone who deviates from this model would be turning their back on one of the core values of the American Republic. And in so doing, he secured to all mankind a gift of the world's most enduring self-governing republic that with all its flaws remains an inspiration to the world. But the experiment is ongoing, as we know. This is not finished, it remains unfinished. We continue it every day and every time we go to the polls. And the final outcome of this republic is still uncertain. Remember that Rome lasted 500 years after it was no longer a republic. The fault, dear Brutus, will never be in our stars, but in ourselves. As Lincoln said, no one will ever conquer us. As a nation of free men and women, we shall live forever, as he said, or die by suicide. But that need not be our destiny. When in doubt, look to our history to our lodestar. As was said of Voltaire, so we can say about Washington, consider that life and take courage. Thank you very much. Stan, we don't have time for questions, but I want to give you a speaker's gift. Right across from the Georgia Historical Society is the great Candler Oak. It's a 300-year-old oak. That's one of the seedlings. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and here are some instructions with this. OK, Stan, we need you to pick a, a number. And 
half of the proceeds will go to 1350. 1350, and the other half, oh, come on up. All right, very good. The other half goes to Union Mission. All right, two minutes here. Okay, so this past weekend, come on up, come on up. We did the uh, tree replacement project at Wormslow. Thank you so much. Yeah, one of those. Thank you so much for um, all the Rotarians that showed up. The first 10 folks that came, I gave them one of these hats, so it looked good with the uh, media. So we're following Rotary International's um, branding. And we had 160 volunteers show up in the community and help plant the 30 trees. And we'll do it again next year, too. And Anita Hagen with the Savannah Magazine, thank you so much. This is an incredible article that, that really highlights uh, the project that this club did and, and a number of uh, other Rotary clubs. So thank you, it's spectacular. And I also want to thank WTOC for doing a lot of live coverage on the event too. So um, reminder number two, we have a tour to the Savannah Hilton Head Airport this Friday. Meet at 11 o'clock on the upper level. Um, I don't know what do you call it, the upper level outside on the curb. And it, the tour is only about 40 minutes long, but it should be really good. Thank you, Ted Kleisner, for helping set that up. And let's see, um, oh, nine years ago, uh, we lost a member, Ben Tucker, and Savannah, the Savannah Philharmonic has just started a musical instrument lending library. So we're asking if you have any old violins or cellos or clarinets, to please bring them during the month of March so we can get them to Dr. Amy Williams and then we can get them into the hands of children that really can't afford uh, instruments. And of course, this goes with one of the, our seven areas of focus with education. And let's see. Todd, thank you for reminding me to please invite everybody to come up and welcome our speaker and our new member. And the last one is, did you know that Jennifer Jones Jennifer Jones will be the first female president to, to ever be the president of Rotary International, and she starts July 1st. Meeting adjourned. That was great. The president told he gave it back to me and said, give it all to 